But after 40 some years now, planted in the 50s AD, it's now in the 90s, they have left their first love. Uh, their love for Jesus himself is not intense. And he tells them, remember from what you have fallen, that standard, and repent uh, and re-engage all of this again. And then, oh, by the way, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in verse 6, I hate that. Does Jesus hate false doctrine? Several times in these letters, he's going to say yes. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, love is what really matters, why doctrine divides and doctrine is not important. But Jesus said it was. He said, get that false doctrine out of your church. That false doctrine that emphasizes only the material blessings of God and not a real sincere relationship with God and a walk with God. Sometimes we love what God does for us more than we love God. And it's not what he's doing for us as much as what we need to be doing for him as an act of worship in response to him. Don't become preoccupied with the externals and miss the Savior. He's the one who is Lord of the church. The second letter uh, is written to the church in Smyrna in verse 8, a persecuted church. Interestingly, there are no words of condemnation to this church. Persecution drives false profession out of the church. Nobody wants to go to a church where there's a martyr board in front with all the list of the names of everybody that died for their faith in Christ. And yet in the ancient Roman world, there were a lot of churches like that with a lot of martyrs, with a lot of people who gave their ultimate witness, their ultimate testimony, and sealed it with their lives. And today, outside of America, oh, there are a lot of persecuted churches around the world, uh, persecuted in places like uh, India and Asia, uh, persecuted perhaps even in China, perhaps in other countries that are closed to the message of the gospel in Islamic communities where their gospel is not allowed to be preached and proclaimed. Oh, there are a lot of Christians who, if necessary, have to give their life for the cause of Christ. And he says to this church that have suffered so much, I know your works, verse 9, your tribulation, your troubles, your poverty, but you are rich. Uh, you've even had that faithful martyr. I understand all of that. I gave my life for your salvation. And the fact that you're willing to give your life for me tells me you really believe, you really trust, you really know me as your personal Savior. You see, we have to ask ourselves, am I only willing to live for Jesus because of what I think He can do for me? Or am I willing to die for Him if necessary? What I've discovered is, if you're not willing to die for Him, you're really not willing to live for Him. Uh, if it's all about you, and it's not all about Him, then we make self-centered, selfish decisions and choices that do not honor Him at all. The persecuted church understood we're suffering these things for the cause of Christ, and Jesus is worth it. The third letter is written to the church at Pergamos. Pergamos was the official headquarters of the Roman military leadership in Asia Minor. That's where the government was headquartered. Ephesus was the largest city, uh, the city from which these churches had spread, but it was Pergamos where the military headquarters were. It was there that the altar of Zeus, the god of power, uh, was the dominant feature of that ancient community. And it was there that the Christians were tempted to be politically correct. A political church that had to walk a fine line between what we say we believe about Jesus and what we have to do to accommodate the government. And it's no different today that sometimes the goal of political correctness drives us away from the very truths of the Word of God, and we're more concerned about how we're accepted in society than how we're accepted in heaven with Jesus himself. And he said of that church, I know where you are. You're in the city where Satan's seat is, where the devil is in charge of that government. Whether it's the capital city of any major nation of the world, or whether it's any city in which Satan is really in control, Jesus understands that. I know you're living in a city that is walking away from God. 
I know you're living in a city that has abandoned the principles of real Christian morality, and you have to live out your faith uh, as a spiritual minority in a vast sea of secularism, in a vast sea of an immoral culture, and yet I want you to live for me because it's then that your light shines brightest in the darkness and that you can make a difference. Stand up for the Savior that loves you. And the fourth letter is written to the church at uh, Thyatira. Now, the interesting thing about these cities is, as archaeologists excavated them, Thyatira is the smallest of the seven cities, and yet it has the longest letter because it had the most problems. Uh, he said to this prosperous church, oh, you're succeeding. You're in a prosperous community. What we know uh, historically about Thyatira the clothing industry was headquartered there. Uh, the purple dyes came from this place. Uh, the women were making a lot of money in Thyatira, working in the clothing industry, etc. And yet he says, I know of your good works, your charity, your service, your faith, etc. You're busy. You like doing things for God. But I have some things against you. Uh, in verse 20, you've tolerated a false prophetess in that town. He calls her Jezebel. She's not literally Jezebel. He takes that symbol from the wicked queen in the Old Testament. What he's saying is it's like her. She's seducing you uh, into a lifestyle that is not of God and is not from God. And I'm telling you, throw her out. Get rid of her. Uh, does Jesus care that we teach the truth? Yes, absolutely. Are there men and women, both sometimes, that don't teach the truth of God, that pull people away from the truth, unfortunately, this passage would say, yes, there are. In fact, he calls their beliefs uh, in verse 24, the depths of Satan. Oh, they act like they're gonna lead you into a deeper knowledge of God. They're pulling you away from the God of the Bible. They're pulling you away from the truth. They're pulling you into the depths of Satan. I'm telling you, stand up for the truth and do something about it. Either leave that church or get rid of that leader. Uh, that's Jesus saying these things. If he wrote a message to our church, what would he say? Whoa, he might say, you need to make some real serious changes. Then you go to chapter three. The fifth letter is written to the church of Sardis, a powerless church. Sardis was an ancient city a city that had once been the capital of that entire area. And yet over time, it had become an old, dying city. And this appears to be an old, dying church. He says in verse 2, Wake up! Strengthen the things that are remaining because you are about to die. You're just an old, dead, traditional church going through the routine of religion without the power of God, without the power of the gospel, without the message of Christ. It's all about religion and not a relationship with the God of heaven. Uh, therefore, you need to repent. Why? Because I'll come like a thief and take your candlestick away from you. You'll cease to be a real church. The flame of truth will go out in that place. Some of you have attended a dead church, and you keep hoping, waiting, somehow it'll come back to life one day, and it's been dead for so long it may never come back to life. Now, God may be saying, I want you to be the presence of life in that place, uh, but sometimes God says, you know what? It's time to bury this thing and move on. Uh, it's time to go to a place where God is really at work, where people are being saved, where the word is being preached, where things are happening to the glory of God. And he warns Sardis, be careful. Your church is going to die. And we know from history that it ultimately did. Then you come to verse 7, the message to the church at Philadelphia, a persevering church. He says of this church in verse 8, I have set before you an open door of opportunity. You have a little bit of strength and you've persevered. Take that door of opportunity. The interesting thing about Philadelphia is it's up in the mountains and it sits on a mountain pass that leads into Central Asia Minor, what today is Central Turkey. He was saying to them, just like there is a passageway physically through your area, I've set up an open door of spiritual opportunity as well because you're on the crossroads of East and West, of Europe and Asia. 
you can take the gospel in every direction. And you might say, but we're just a small congregation. We're just a handful of people. We don't have a lot of strength. That's all right, he says. I'll bless that and I'll use that to the glory of God. You see, sometimes when our churches become rich and prosperous and successful, we depend on our prosperity instead of the power of God. We depend on our outward success. I look back in church history, and at the end of the 19th century, the 1800s are coming to a close. The churches that had all the money and all the buildings and all the schools and all the theological seminaries were old traditional denominations that were fast becoming spiritually liberal theologically liberal. They were denying the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Bible, the power of the gospel. Those churches were about to die. And God ignited a whole wave of fundamental evangelical Christianity where people took the gospel seriously, took the message of Christ seriously, a personal relationship with Jesus seriously, and the evangelical movement starts the 20th century. Little storefronts, little tiny buildings. But by the end of the 20th century, because we have the message, we have all the money, we have all the success, we have all the big churches, we have all the sound equipment, we have all the PowerPoint, we have the great bands, the great music, etc. And the liberal churches are dying and shrinking. But if we're not careful, we start depending on our success instead of the Savior. And if we're not careful, we'll lose the message and we'll be the dying church of the next generation. Make sure you use the truth to keep the message alive. And then the last letter, verse 14, is written to the church of Laodicea, the putrid church, that he said, you're neither hot nor cold. Nearby there were the cold springs of Colossae, of the Colossian church, the hot springs of Hierapolis. But in Laodicea, the water tended to be lukewarm, and Jesus knew that. So he uses that as an illustration, a word picture. Your church is lukewarm. Oh, Laodicea was a very prosperous community. They were rich. They were increased with goods. But he said, you're really spiritually poor, blind, and naked. Uh, I used to hear preachers say 50 years ago, uh, yeah, that's those dead liberal churches. They're the church of Laodicea. But I look at the church today in the 21st century, and I have to ask myself, or is that a lot of our own evangelical churches that think we're rich, we're prosperous, we're big, we're successful. We have thousands of people attending. But if Jesus isn't there, is our Christianity a mile wide and an inch deep? Are we so spiritually lukewarm, we're not even able to make a dent in the culture in which we have to function? Uh, there are millions of people that claim to be born-again Christians in this country, and yet this country is going in the wrong direction in overdrive. Morality is in chaos, uh, the church is in confusion, and our culture is in a deep divide because it's starting to come apart at the very core of what we're really all about as a nation and as a people. And it's to this lukewarm church that Jesus says in verse 19, whom I love, I rebuke. I'm, I, I don't want to get rid of you. I don't want to remove your candlestick. Therefore, in verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking on the church door. Now, we use the verse sometimes to say, Jesus is knocking on the heart's door of the unbeliever. And indeed, he does do that. But in the context of the passage, in chapter 3, verse 20, that's part of the letter to the church of Laodicea. They've locked the Lord of the church outside of the church. It's like Jesus is on the outside, knocking on the door saying, let me back in the church. Uh, I should be the Lord of the church. Let it be all about me and your relationship to me. But all too often, our attitude about church is, no, it's all about us. I'm going to go to the one that's really cool. I'm going to go to the one that meets my needs. I'm going to go to the one that makes me happy, the one that tells me what I want to hear. And Jesus would say, no, you need to be in the church that is honoring me, worshiping me, exalting me. Now, the convicting thing about those letters are they really speak to all churches at all times. There have always been churches that are preoccupied and persecuted, and there have always been churches that are prosperous or political or churches that are powerless or persevering or 
actually lukewarm and putrid. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of church is my church? And then ask yourself, what kind of a believer am I? What if he applied all of that to me and to my life? Because Jesus wants to be Lord of your life in every area, in every detail. Open your heart and let him come in. It's good to be with you here today, and uh, I have the privilege to uh, serve as the uh, senior pastor. Well, that was Mark Hitchcock, but he's not on yet. And he is here. So, well, this is going to work out just great because a lot of you have already told me it's hard to get all the information you want and the resources in the gymnasium. So we're going to take a break and we're going to start promptly at 1.30. How do I know we are? Because I'm preaching. <laughs> so anyway, we got a great afternoon and evening coming, and Jack will be back too. So we're going to have a wonderful time. So um, have a wonderful lunch, and um, don't everybody go to the same place. <laughs> and you might have to wear a mask but you can take it off to eat. <laughs> so have a good time. We'll see you at 1.30.